a two minute warning or more there are two organizations that you, Ray referred to one of them that you may want to get on the mailing list for one is Answers in Genesis up at Florence, Kentucky and uh, they have websites and everything and this is usually what you get each month and they have a big bookstore up there and these are the people that's putting up the Creation Museum up uh, close to Cincinnati, Kentucky Northern Kentucky Airport Ken Ham and uh, so I'll make this available for people to look at and then an older organization and Ken Ham used to work for these people out in California El Cajon California Institute for Creation Research this is originally Henry Morse, uh, Dwayne Gish, uh, John Whitcomb and these are the people that uh, really uh, have revitalized creationism and they have websites, bookstores, all the, both these organizations have uh, people who travel around and give uh, seminars and lectures and so if you ever get anywhere close to where Institute of Creation Research or Answers in Genesis are having a seminar you really should attend it because they really do it upright you know their slides are really printed and in color they're not made with a magic marker on the kitchen table and uh, they, uh, they have all their reference material and footnotes and tech journals and they usually have a big bookstore with them when they come. And uh, we're going to try to get a tri-state creation seminar over Clear Creek. And when we do, we're going to invite these people to come and to bring a big bookstore. So we'll keep you notified on that. So anybody that wants to look at these and scan through them, get addresses off of them or anything, and all you have to do is just do go to the computer and get on the, the mailing list or write them or drop them a card or something like that. Uh, I thought maybe that uh, we might uh, just also look at a couple of articles. This one right here, uh, it, it shows a picture of a couple of scientists and they have a fossil in a tray and this fossil incidentally was spirited out of northern China. In other words, it was stolen, uh, smuggled, and uh, sold in the United States for, I forget how much, it was some $35,000 or something. And not only that, but when it hit, National Geographic was so impressed with it, they made a special display. Now remember, from this rock over here, this rock, they built this, this bird here. Totally. I mean, you can see every feather, you can see its bill, everything from a flat, flattened uh, speculation. They built that bird. Well, this rock's now been determined to be a hoax. It's two fossils put together. It's a fossil of a reptile and a fossil of a bird put together trying to prove that dinosaur bird link. And uh, in fact, when this fossil surfaced, and National Geographic put a big spread in their, one of their issues, I think it was November two years ago. And uh, what they did was uh, the Smithsonian guy was a little more honest than they were. And he went to them and he said, there's a good possibility that that fossil may embarrass you. And they went ahead and built that model of that whole bird-like dinosaur from that hoax rock and indeed it has embarrassed them but it didn't faze them they just kept right on moving with it and uh, they they usually have quite a bit of resilience to that you've heard about uh, uh, Stephen Gole Stephen Gole uh, has proposed a thing called NOMA and just to make a make a long story short NOMA is uh, where that uh, the evolutionists are asking the creationists Let's just agree to disagree and go our own separate ways and you stay out of our business and we'll stay out of your business. You stay in religion, we'll stay in science. Well, that's very clever because it's an attempt to disguise evolution as science and evolution is strictly religion. And um, in this article, let me, let me just read you one little thing here. It says... Uh, that uh, Stephen Gould has no kick coming from the Buddhists, the Hindus, Scientologists, Unitarians. 
unwittingly, they, they've signed on to Noma. In other words, they, agree, they, they believe that anyway, that there's more than one God, there's more ways to heaven than one. There's no absolute uh, creator, there's no absolute uh, salvation. Evidently then, the quarrelsome partner who won't come to the table is not religion in general, but evangelical Christianity. In other words, that's the real target of this, is to target Christianity. I had a question, and I had to really think about this question. Uh, if evolutionists are evolutionists because they do not want to be accountable to God, are they, uh, are they not then creationists? I had to think about that question a while, and I, I think that's the question, what it's referring to is uh, if a person objects to uh, creationism because they don't want to be accountable to a god, then evidently they must believe there's a creator god. And so I think it was a statement of uh, that actually they're disclosing their belief in the fact that they fight it so ardently and so hard. Uh, that's, uh, you know, why does communism strike out so heavily at democracy or why does democracy strike out so heavy at communism because they're antagonists they stand for different things and so I guess one could say that if a person really objects to creationism because they don't want to be accountable to a creator God then basically they're afraid that there is a creator God and they need to satisfy themselves that uh, there's uh, there's no uh, there's no chance in this, and they'll grasp onto anything to keep from believing that. Well, we've talked about in our introduction that really we're talking about two religions. We're talking about creationism and evolutionism. Uh, there's two opinions about the Earth's age, as you know. Uh, there's one opinion that the Earth is very, very old. It's now up to uh, 12 to 15 billion, incidentally. And uh, so... Uh, it just gets older every every so often, and uh, there's two opinions. One's very old, and one's very young. The one that's very young has stayed stable all these this time. You know, ever since God created it, that belief has been stable. God did it in six days. Uh, we can't tell exactly sure, but looking at the Bible, how long ago it was. But we do know in the genealogies that since man started aging, in other words, at the the flood or the fall. Actually, he started aging at the flood, but he started dying at the fall. And so from the time of the fall in the garden, uh, it would appear it was about 4,000 B.C., about 6,000 years ago. And from looking at the genealogies. And a lot of people just have a real problem with that because they think just because something looks old, it is old. Uh, but what is, what is old? That's a matter of opinion. How can we put a date on anything that uh, was here before we had written records or histories of it? But we've got a pretty good written record in history of our total time. We've got a record. Uh, God made sure that Moses was inspired to write about the, uh, the creation and about the flood and about the, uh, the tower and about the call of Abram and Isaac Jacob and all those guys you know. Uh, there's another interesting article that's in the paper, and that's the one I dropped down here. And this one's yesterday. If I were to cut all these out, in a matter of a year, I'd have a stack that high. I mean, the press really loves evolution. They really do. And uh, listen to this one. This is yesterday now in the Lexington Herald Leader. Existence might be a matter of decay. Well, it goes on to say that uh, these physicists have been doing all this study of matter and antimatter. In other words, matter and antimatter. It said it could explain, help explain, why the universe is filled with something rather than nothing. Uh, can you imagine working in research? And their, one of their biggest questions is, why is the universe filled with something rather than nothing? Well, in the first place, how can you fill anything with nothing? Because if you have nothing, you don't have anything. English teachers are really getting me for that one. But uh, it goes on to say, Big Bang occurred 13 billion years ago. Here it is, right in print. It says, at, that, at Big Bang... Equal amounts of matter and antimatter were created. 
Notice the use of the word created. Created without a creator. It just brought itself into existence. Happenstance. It just occurred. No reason, no direction, no energy, no anything. There was nothing. There was nothing in the universe as if the universe existed, but it didn't have anything in it. And then suddenly it created something to occupy the nothing. And researchers know that when these two forms of matter collide, matter and antimatter, they annihilate each other. In other words, it ceases to exist. Well, if it annihilates each other and ceases to exist, that's a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. And it says, but there's almost no antimatter in the universe today. This raises a question that has fascinated and perplexed physicists. Why is the universe still filled with matter? In other words, why does the universe still have stars, planets, and people? Why isn't the cosmos a complete void? In other words, these are scientists now, physicists, and, and their perplexing problem is, how can we exist? I mean, that's the question. How do we exist? How come if there's matter and antimatter, when it first started with Big Bang equal amounts, and when they collide, they annihilate each other, then why is the universe still filled with something? Why are there stars and galaxies and suns and moons and, and people and plants and rocks and trees? They don't understand that. And then over toward the last, uh, last part of this article, it said that they've discovered at least two kinds of subatomic particles that exhibit this puzzling phenomenon. In other words, that's where millions of dollars are being spent, right there. And uh, they really uh, believe in themselves. See, it's, it's a faith-based thing. It's not science. It's faith-based. It is a religion. It's a philosophy. See, a philosophy has no way of, of proving itself. You can't test a philosophy. A philosophy is a thought process. You can't subject to a scientific uh, method and uh, say where it's true or untrue. A philosophy is just a philosophy. It's a thought process. There have been lots of philosophers and they have very wild ideals. And philosophers are much like the evolutionist is they are all looking for a new discovery, a new something to make them famous or something of that nature. Well, we had these two religions and these two opinions, two philosophies, and we talked about a global flood. Is it myth or truth? And we presented a lot of things that tend to show that the earth at one time was covered with water at the same time. And uh, the dinosaurs coexist or not? Yes, coexisted. Uh, I don't know if we talked about the footprints down in the Paluxet River, Glen Rose, Texas, of dinosaurs and men fossilized together, some even overlapping with one another. We did talk about all the dragon stories and the eyewitness accounts, the slaying of dragons or dinosaurs in Italy. We also figured out why the word dinosaur is not in the Bible. Because the King James Version was translated in 1611 and the word dinosaur was not coined until about 1843. In other words, it's a little hard to use a word that won't come in existence for 200 more years. Therefore, they translated that word ton which, uh, into dragon in English. And of course, we have found out from cave drawings and, and embroidery and basket uh, drawings and all kinds of things from China and from other places, even in the United States, even out in Utah, cave engravings, engravings on the walls out there. We found out that these dragons... If, if, we had the, if we had the word dinosaur back in 1611, the King James people without a doubt that translated the Bible would have translated those passages in Job and elsewhere. They would have used the word dinosaur without a problem. And then, of course, there's that perplexing thing about that uh, wall drawing that we talked about. And, of course, today, Ice Age, ancient or recent? Remember back in the flood when we talked about the global flood, we talked about the, the rising ocean levels from the melting of the ice caps. And the ice caps, of course, 
uh, in the evolutionist way of thinking occurred over millions of years and at least four times the ice came down and melted back and came down and melted back and came down and melted back. Now it's up to 20 times. In other words, the ice caps are supposed to have uh, we're supposed to have 20 separate ice ages now according to evolution. You see they just need more. Every time when they discover something they find out they need more time. They need more advances and retreats of the ice to do the, these different things. And uh, so they just simply add it in without, you know, without any kind of uh, justification, proof or anything. It just added in. Why is it that uh, we're not at all critical or suspicious, we just seem to sort of accept uh, things written in human books or presented by human people to have a couple of PhDs behind their name or something like that or they're highly educated or, or uh, you know, they've got a reputation or they hold a high position in some research institute. Whatever they say, we just seem to believe it, you know, we're not really critical of it. But somebody comes out and makes a statement about there was a worldwide flood and everybody immediately wants to challenge you. Oh, how are you going to prove that? Where is your evidence? Well, my question is, why aren't we subjecting these other people to the same criteria that they subject us to in our beliefs this way? We do have a very ancient historical document that's very old called the Bible that has uh, all these accounts written down that are unchanging over the thousands of, year, thousands of years. And look how the story keeps changing with evolution constantly. And they grasp at straws, grasping at that fossil that was uh, uh, brought out of China. And, and it, it, it's, it's been put together very expertly, you know, a piece of a reptile, a true fossil of a, of a reptile and a true fossil of a bird. But they put the two different fossils together and because they're so desperate to link the dinosaur to the bird. The uh, New York uh, Museum of Natural History, because they're trying so desperately now to link dinosaurs and birds, they've got to account for the disappearance of the dinosaurs. Remember last week we stopped with the point that the dinosaurs are still with us, they just fly around, that they all evolved into birds, they really didn't vanish. They're so desperate to try to make up through this story of the vanishing, the mysterious vanishing of the dinosaurs, that the New York Museum of Natural History spent millions of dollars recently to remodel their whole bird area, Avery, Avery, Avery area. And what they've done is they've even taken a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now this is that dinosaur stood up, had them little tiny arms on the front, has a big jaws and great big teeth in them, you know, it's supposed to have been very vicious. They now have posed that skeleton, they've redone it, and they've posed the skeleton down like in a running position like the uh, road runner. You know, they, they've actually taken the bones now and rearranged them to make this Tyrannosaurus Rex look like a road runner. So in other words, showing that, oh, from the Tyrannosaurus Rex, he's still with us today. He's a road runner out in New Mexico running around the desert, you know and uh, being chased by Wiley the Fox or Coyote or whatever it is, okay. Always did when I loved those cartoons. Always wanted that coyote to catch that road runner. You know, one cartoon I thought, man, this is wonderful. He, he caught it, he plucked it, and he roasted it. And then he woke up. <laughs> he was dreaming. The whole cartoon didn't let you know he was asleep. But anyway, we're, we're headed toward evil. And we're headed toward this thing about race and the National Academy of Sciences and other things. And of course what we did is we looked at creation and evolution, same evidence, everybody has same evidence, same bones, same universe, two different views. A Christian worldview and a secular worldview. That's what we're dealing with. And uh, it, it's not any different, it's just two views, a secular view and a worldview. And there they are, evolution and creation. We've looked at this several times. We've compared them. And uh, you see one takes six days to get us here. The other's vast amount of time. So it goes right on down. And uh, we've looked at that before. I am going to make copies of all these overheads and put them together. My, my goal was to have that ready today, but uh, you see I didn't do it. And there again, and here's the, the important one here is, 
that evolution in our future is the death of our star. Life will cease to exist in our uh, particular system here with the sun and the moon and the earth. Life will just, all life, all life will cease to exist. Not anything can survive if uh, our sun dims. And our sun will dim because of the second law of thermodynamics. Because every time there's a reaction, a natural occurring reaction in chemistry, uh, you going from the left to the right, left to the right, that's natural occurring in chemistry, and you will lose a certain amount of energy in the form of heat that's never attainable again. In other words, it's gone forever. And that means that every, as long as the sun's up there with those thermonuclear explosions, those thermonuclear furnace, the whole sun is, that it's consuming itself. And eventually what will happen is it will get to the point to where it will actually uh, just go out. Now, of course, it's predicted to take several million years to do that by the scientists. I mean, at the rate, they know it's consuming itself. That's the reason we have a space program. We figured out our, our sun is going to go out a few million years. So by the time a few million years gets here, we need it to have worked out all the arrangements and transfer people from here to our next home. I mean, this starts to sound like Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and, and Star Wars, isn't it? And, uh, but anyway, over here, our future is much different. The future here is the future of eternity with the Lord. And they do not like that idea. They'd rather not have an eternity. Just annihilation. I see we're still trying to save animals and plants interfering with evolution. You know, still setting aside vast acreages so an owl can exist. Don't damn rivers so a smelt arter can live. That's interfering with evolution. If you're a true evolutionist, you know what? You can be an environmentalist. Because a true evolutionist would say, survival of the fittest. Scientific method, creationism, nor evolution. Neither one can observe, they cannot propose, they cannot experiment, they cannot gather data. Both can start at the bottom of the chart and formulate a theory. But there's no proof. So now it becomes a philosophy. See, to re be real science, you have to be up here. You can't start down in the bottom of the chart. You have, you have to be in the upper parts of the chart. You have to start in the right place. Why, wow, they'd have laughed me out of the university if I'd have proposed a solution to my hypothesis without doing my research. I mean, they'd have just told me to go on home. But uh, what happened is I had to involve myself in a couple of years of gathering data and going through many, many mice and research animals and things. We saw this week, paper also, someone now thinks that, uh, that mice and, and cats and dogs are really suffering at the hands of scientists and so they're taking these exorbitant uh, processes to put some kind of federal restrictions on and uh, be politically correct, you know, we're going to have to start teaching, treating dogs and cats better than we treat human beings. And uh, I have a real problem with that one. But I don't want to mistreat animals by the same token. Uh, I look to see what we're doing to people and not feeding people. And I look to see the amount of dog and cat food on the shelves in the stores and we're not feeding people, that bothers me. Okay, then we, we talk about how old is the earth? And like I said, we're not sure, evidence, 7,000 to 35,000. That's using evolutionary principles right there. 7,000 to 35,000 years, evolutionary principles. I don't believe the earth's any older than seven to 10,000 at the very most. Probably closer to 6,500, 6,300, I'm not sure. But it's impossible to be millions and billions, and we showed all those different criteria uh, showing that it was impossible because of helium flux, the amount of helium in the atmosphere, uh, nickel content of the ocean, the uh, cosmic sphere depth on the moon and the earth, uh, stalactite formation, um, the 
accumulation of nickel in the ocean. There was many, many things that we looked at, the disintegration of the magnetic field, the half-life there, all those things. And then we looked at uh, the evidence that was there uh, to show that there, there was this uh, gigantic flood which can explain the Grand Canyon, the Badlands of South Dakota, Yellowstone National Park. It can explain the deserts. It can explain Grand Canyon. It can explain the continental shelf that lies out under the ocean off our seashore where the old seashore used to be, showing that our ocean levels have been coming up for a couple thousand years. They're still coming up, incidentally. And the ice is still melting back. Where we used to go to Antarctica and had to, uh, uh, in Antarctica, you, you were actually camped on the ice. Now you can sail in there with a ship many, many miles. The ice has retreated drastically over Antarctica. And uh, so, how about dinosaurs? They're big because they sell evolution. They sell millions and billions of years. And uh, they, sell, they sell natural process without a designer. They just happen to occur. And yet, it's supposed to have been millions of years ago. Life's dinosaurs supposed to have vanished by at least 65 millions of years ago. But these uh, petroglyphs carved in stone. Here's one from White River Canyon in Utah. And how in the world do these Indians know how to draw the picture of a dinosaur without having seen one? And there's a drawing, as we stated, of a Tyrannosaurus rex in a cave. And I'm, that one's down in the southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, or somewhere down there. But this one right here is uh, up in Utah. And then we, we talked about the fact of paleontologists. You know, there's atheist paleontologists and there's Christian paleontologists, just like there's uh, atheist uh, bus drivers and Christian bus drivers, like there's atheist teachers and Christian teachers. All paleontologists are not um, evolutionists or atheists. There are some Christian paleontologists, but they're in the minority. But aren't Christians in the minority in every area? Certainly. So that doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that, well, because there's only a small amount of Christian biologists, that means that uh, you know, the truth of the matter is evolution. That, that's, that's a dumb argument, you know. Majority doesn't mean anything because uh, Christians are a minority in every area. Sometimes I begin to believe that Christians are in the majority in the church. And uh, I don't know if that's a politically correct statement or not. The Ice Age. The Ice Age is an evidence for old ancient earth making or is it uh, post-flood? Now basically you can simply say that the, uh, the Ice Age can be better accounted for as a result after the flood than any other way. Uh, you cannot get the Ice Age the way it's proposed by the evolutionists. You just can't do it. It won't work. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the other thing is, if you'll recall, the Ice Age is supposed to have been a long period of time, uh, somewhere between, I think, uh, probably a couple of million years to 11,000 years ago. The Ice Age is supposed to have ceased about, about 10,000 years ago, about 8,000 B.C. And uh, then in these, this period of time between 2 million years ago and 11,000 years ago, the ice would come down and cover North America down to about Ohio, Michigan, Ohio. Uh, it covered Northern Europe. Uh, it came up from the south and covered parts of, uh, of Argentina and, and uh, that area down there, Tasmania, over south of um, Australia. And it, sort of, it got us from both directions, see, and then it would melt back. And then it would refreeze again and melt back. They used to say, I remember in the textbooks when I first got exposed to this four times. But I noticed here recently the last thing I saw in it was that uh, at least 20 times. So it just, it, that's how much it changes. I think I, way back uh, a month or so ago I talked about how that in all my educational process, how that, that in my, every time I got to a higher level of school, 
By that time, the evolutionists had advanced their theory drastically from 100,000 years to a million years to a billion years. 3.2 to 5 billion stayed around for a long time. That one was, they thought that's pretty stable. You know, you know the difference between 3.2 and 5 billion? You know, when you just write 3.2 to 5, that don't look like much difference, 1.8. Put all the zeros on there and see how much difference that is. That's a lot of difference, you know. But now it's up to 12 to 15, and I noticed that one article just sort of settled in at 13 billion. 13 billion years. Uh, they needed more time. Why did they need more time? Because Hubble Telescope, when they finally got it fixed and they looked out there, and it lost its resolution at about 13 to 15 billion light years out. But they, 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 it did not find the end. It did not find the edge of the expanding universe. So now they need a bigger telescope. And what they'll find is they'll find 20, 25, 30 billion years of universe. And their telescope will run out of its power again. And they'll need a bigger telescope. We're wasting money like crazy. All you have to do is consult with the Bible. And the Bible simply says man cannot measure God's creation. It's very simple. We'll never be able to find the edge of the universe. And that's a dumb thing anyway. It comes right back to that article that, that I, I was reading. It was in the paper yesterday. This void, in other words, the universe should be full of, but should be full of nothing. You know? <laughs> and so here we have... Uh, an expanding universe, my question has always been, what is it expanding into? Because if it's non-existence, how can you put something in nothing? I don't understand that. Now, some people may say, well, you know, it's no problem. You just put it in there. Well, you have to have something. How can I put eggs in a non-existing sack? You know, how am I going to put eggs in a non-existing basket? How am I going to put eggs in a non-existing box? In other words, just because I have the egg and I want to put it, suddenly the box comes along, it's invented at the same time, comes from magic somewhere. How can I put something into nothing? And how can I get something from nothing? And uh, most evolutionists don't want to start there. They want to start already with a universe full of hydrogen gas with some energy running around. Well, where in the world did this hydrogen gas and this energy come from? You're talking about mass and energy. First law of thermodynamics. Where did it come from? Always existent? Always existent? The universe is its own God? You know, it sounded like a little new age there to me. Well... These interglacial periods are those periods in between when the ice would melt back, that's interglacial, and it'd come back. And the interglacial periods are thought to have been about 10% of the total time. Well, to get an ice age, you have to have very special conditions. You have to have warm oceans and very cold land masses. You cannot have that in a slow cool down. You know, we've heard, you know, we looked at Miller and Urey's experiment of bubbling that water like a bubbling cauldron of an ancient ocean and the gases and electricity going through it is supposed to form prototypes of amino acids. Miller and Urey's uh, creation of life in the laboratory in 1953. Of course, we showed, you know, we talked about how that that could not occur because uh, of all the things you have to do and which did not exist back then. But this ocean's supposed to have been boiling hot. And uh, so it's supposed to cool down slowly. And you've heard the story. Then you get some condensation. You finally get some rain. And you finally get some erosion. And next thing you know, you're making soil from rock. And next thing you know, uh, just some way or another, some of these rock and materials just got together at the right time under the right circumstance and come a living sail. And that living cell gave rise to everything on earth that lives. That one first one. That's what it's supposed to have done. You can't form an ice age with gradual cool down. You have to have hurricanes over the north and south pole 
being fed by warm water and cold land masses and you have to evaporate the water out of the oceans, come up over the land masses where it's very cold and the water vapor has to drop out as snow and form into ice and do it very quickly. It has to be a hurricane. In other words, continuous hurricanes of several hundred years. The earth was really torn up uh, during the flood and it had to settle down. And even in Genesis it says that uh, God now was going to make seasons. And he's going to, in other words, he, he brought weather into existence. There was no weather phom phenomena as we know them today before the flood. There was no tornadoes or hurricanes or... There was no, no rain, there was no flooding, there was uh, not any of these things. Uh, tornadoes, all the whole works. Windstorm, snow, ice, glaciers, tall peaks with snow caps on them. There was none of that. That's all post-flood. The earth had to really settle in. We'll talk about it again in just a moment. Creation, soon after the flood, lasted less than 1,000 years one time. And just like the flood water still with us, it's out there, we call it the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the India Ocean. The flood water is still with us. Then we also still have with us uh, this, this ice age, the remnants of it. It's called glaciers and Arctic ice. That's the remnants of the ice age, still with us. And you know, in a year when the ice really melts back quite a bit, they're finding more and more of these frozen mammoths, rhinoceros, crocodiles, and horses. And even they found a man. Uh, well, one in Austria, Italy, the, what, in the border right between the two, two countries. And, uh, but also there was another one found up in uh, Montana or somewhere up in the northern part of the United States or southern Canada. And that one so bothered the evolutionists that somebody came along and says, well, you know, we can't keep this body. This body obviously is of a Native American. It must be reburied under the under our national law that we will not fool around with the graves of Native Americans. And they took the body back out and buried it in an undisclosed spot. And the reason they did that is because the first report that were coming out from that were going totally counter to evolution. And uh, they don't like evidence like that. If they could get that uh, lump of coal with that gold chain in it out of that museum somewhere, they'd destroy that. They'd break the gold. They'd break the lump of coal and throw the chain away and the gold away, or the coal away. That iron pot found in a block of coal, they'd, they'd love to get that and destroy it. They don't like that kind of evidence laying around. They don't like these drawings of these dinosaurs on the cave walls and these engravings of dinosaurs. They don't like stories about Baptista, the peasant in Italy in 1500 killing a dinosaur in the woods. I mean, they don't like that. They don't like the picture in 1977 of a Japanese fishing boat with a seagoing dinosaur caught in its fishing net. They don't like those things. They don't publish them in National Geographic and Nature and on the A&E Channel and History Channel and Discovery Channel. You only find them in special books and things. In fact, I don't know, I don't think I showed you all. I may have. I ever show you that, Dinosaurs by Design? Dinosaurs by Design. Uh, here's a picture of the dinosaur caught in a fishing net. 1977 and Pleosaurus that's 1977 the captain of the boat would not allow it to be brought aboard the, the boat because they had a full load of fish this is very unfortunate because he could have dumped this fish and put this guy on ice and made a whole lot more money than the load of fish and a marine biologist studied this took specimens from it photographed it, measured it and it's been documented as a Pleosaurus dinosaur. Did y'all hear about it? Did it make national headlines, National Geographic? You heard anything about it? No, there's a picture of it right there. You know what they say when you show them that picture? You show an evolutionist that picture? That's a, sh that's a whale 
that the sharks have been eating on. And uh, you can see his two flippers hanging down right here. You can see his long neck and his head hanging down here. I don't see how in the world you could take a whale, no matter how much sharks ate on him, and you would wind up having that remaining from the body of a whale. And I'll try to bring these books and lay them out before class starts so you guys can look at some of them, you know. And But anyway, uh, there's uh, other pictures in this little book here. Calinthia, Calinthia, and Megamouth. And these are, these are things that were fossilized and uh, they were strictly fossils, missing links and things like that. They come to find out that fishermen in South Africa had been catching these things and they had what, what they call ugly fish club who could catch the ugliest fish and they were catching these living fossils. And they'd caught them for years and years and finally come to the notice of some scientists and they got to looking and they said, this can't be. These guys are supposed to die out millions of years ago. So they're finding more and more of these missing, missing links that uh, are alive today, you know. So uh, that's the uh, two thought processes there. Now, Mount St. Helens, you know, flood water, ice age, carving. You know, we're supposed to have a ice caps come down through here and carved out our valleys and things. And we have rocks laying around. There's supposed to be rocks that were left by the glaciers and that type of thing. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. We're going to talk a whole class period about Mount St. Helens. In fact, we may not uh, be able to get it all in in one class period. It's such a fascinating thing. There's a 25-foot stratified deposit formed in less than one day out there. It's documented. In other words, today, there was not that 25-foot pot, that stratified little cliff. The next day, there's 25 feet of cliff that was made yesterday. Now, if, if you did not know it was made in one day, and you took a geologist out there, and you said, how long did it take to make this? And he would have told you, oh, this is the evidence. Every one of these little thin layers is evidence of an age of time uh, where you had volcanic action and laying down of this, this uh, pumice from these volcano dust over the eruptions over hundreds of thousands, maybe a million or two million years. 25 foot cliff made in less than one day and actually the day was June 12, 1980. And there it is. Along with this there was another five or six hundred foot of cliff made with this over the two year period of time. Two years. Made of three different kinds of materials which would suggest to the geologist that uh, the oceans moved in, the oceans moved out, and different things happened. But yet, Mount St. Helens sat right there and erupted in 1980. And yet, by 1982, they had this six or 700 foot cliff made of three different deposits that was made by Mount St. Helens. Now, how in the world can we look at anything today and, and presuppose how it happened in a basis of uniformitarianism that the key to the past is the present? In other words, if I look at the uh, way that water erodes uh, rock today, and I say then that's how long it took the water, Colorado River, to make the Grand Canyon, but cutting through a mile deep of rock, and it took hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Well, that's been totally thrown out as we've discussed before, but that was the theory for quite a while, that water eroded the Grand Canyon. And the way they do that is they say they look at the erosion rate of water in rock today and they say that's the key to the past. At the rate something happens today, at the rate that's always happened. Well, how can you say that when you get an explosion like Mount St. Helens and you make 25 foot of cliff in less than one day? Well, if that's the case, how long would it take to make the Rocky Mountains at 25 foot a day? Wouldn't take you very long, would it? No, it wouldn't take you any hundreds of millions and millions and millions of years. And besides that, uh, you know, you don't have to come up with ridiculous things like moving the Matterhorn in Switzerland from northwest Africa over hundreds of millions of years by, by continental uh, movement. And that's where the Matterhorn in Switzerland is supposed to come from. It's supposed to come from North Africa. It's supposed to move up there to Switzerland. And they really believe that kind of stuff. They believe this plate tectonics and plate movement as explaining earthquakes and all of these things. 
Earthquakes today are simply aftershocks of the first big earthquake. See, an earthquake, God's the one that cracked the earth. He cracked the earth in the great rift. That great rift runs right through what we call the Dead Sea. Runs right out the bottom of the Dead Sea through the Arabah, right into the right arm of the Red Sea. Comes out, goes into the Horn of Africa, goes all the way down East Africa, and goes down to what we call Victoria Falls. It turns west from the Jordan Valley, goes underneath Jerusalem, and goes out into the Mediterranean. It's the greatest earthquake fault line on the earth. Another gigantic earthquake fault line is the one out in San Andreas, out in California. Another great earthquake fault line is Cumberland Gap. I don't know if you knew you set that close to a big one. And another gigantic one that's one of the largest earthquakes that's ever happened on earth, other than the first big one with the flood, is the New Madrid earthquake fault line out in New Madrid, Missouri, which goes right, uh, affects the western edge of Kentucky and all the way down to Memphis, Tennessee. And if the same earthquake occurred today that occurred back in 1803 or somewhere back in the early 1800s, that earthquake would level Memphis. That earthquake was felt around the earth. That's how strong it was. The, the ground actually liquefied and the trees just sunk like in water. And the crack was so big that the Mississippi River ran from the north and the south both to fill up the crack. And today, if you look at a map of northwest Tennessee, it's called Real Foot Lake. R-E-E-L. Real Foot Lake. That is the filling of an earthquake fault line. Those, I really believe the earthquakes we have today are aftershocks of the first big one. So you imagine if we're getting uh, aftershocks today up into seven, eight, and nines, and it's been about uh, 3,500 years or so since the flood, uh, you can imagine what that one was like when the earth cracked and this water under pressure come running out of the ground, tearing the earth all to pieces, went up into the atmosphere as water spouts, tore up the heavens, in other words, the the water that was uh, stored above, ever what was holding that water there. It says the windows of heaven were opened. It's caused the water spouts punched holes in it. Water started falling from the sky, water coming up from the water spouts. And this water traveled through today what we call caverns and caves, like Mammoth Cave, Cujo's Cave, like uh, the uh, great big caves out in New Mexico, Carlsbad Caverns, the ones in France. These are natural openings that water ran through. And the evidence of all these caves is that water ran through these at one time. They're all fairly dry now unless you get down in the water table like the Green River and things and you get into the uh, lake and the water down in Mammoth Cave. There are wet caves. They've now discovered a set of caverns underneath Carlsbad Caverns. They're absolutely phenomenally beautiful. And... Uh, they, uh, they also have some caves in, in Mexico. Caves are absolutely beautiful things. But stalactites, as we talked about, does not take hundreds of thousands and millions of years to make. Stalactites can form very quickly. Well, the biblical flood caused the Ice Age, you need warm oceans, cold land, polar hurricanes, quick accumulation of ice, slow cool down will not generate an Ice Age. That's a known fact. It not, has to be a uh, cataclysm and you can't keep having 20 cataclysms they used to think you had four to get ice ages but now to be up to 20 that means 20 different times you'd have to have the ocean hot and the land mass cold let me explain how after a flood you get hot oceans and cold land mass you have all this sub this uh, water that's been in the ground that's warm it comes bursting through and now you have all this tremendously warm water as the floodwaters. You have volcanization, in other words, all these volcanoes going off and blowing off when the earth's breaking apart and tearing itself apart. And you put up a lot of dust clouds and you cause the block out the sun. And what happens is the earth cools down, but the water's warm. And so when it finally found itself that way and God decided to make climates, that's what he did to make climates, and all of a sudden this vast amount of water is being evaporated as it's running off the earth, and God said he prepared a place for the waters to run into. And 
then what happens is when you empty all the water underneath here and water's very heavy, it broke the crust and the water ran off, water evaporated. You got these polar hurricanes, you froze the, uh, the water into ice and snow and it packed down and very quickly accumulated. And this probably lasted about 500 years probably, that's just a rough estimate, but it lasted several hundred years. But a slow cool down will not generate the difference between warm water and, and cold land mass to generate an ice cap. So in other words, it's another one of deals where you can't get there from here. Now, you've probably seen these signs alongside the road around here, talking about the Lost Squadron, the P-38 that they're restoring over at Middlesbrough at the airport. If you haven't been there to look at, if you're a fascinated airplane, you should go. Kyle over there, he, you know, he knew that, uh, that back in the 1940s, uh, they were ferrying a whole squadron of bombers and fighters to the war, Second World War in Europe. And the route took them up over uh, Newfoundland, Greenland, Iceland, and over into some islands, and then finally into England. Well, they had these tremendous headwinds, and they were running out of fuel. They had enough fuel to get back to Greenland. They flew back to Greenland, and as they were running out of fuel, they landed on the frozen ice. Frozen ice is most of the time very smooth. They landed all these bombers and fighters there. They couldn't get them out, and they abandoned them. Everything on them, machine guns, ammunition, everything on them. And they pulled the men out because the conditions were Arctic conditions. Pulled the men out during the war. Everything was forgotten about it. Got all covered up. Guy worked Middlesbrough, got permit. He wanted to recover one of these and restore it. And uh, so they took in equipment and they could make hot steam and they steamed themselves. They first uh, did radar or something. They found the airplanes under the ice. The ice is almost 300 feet thick above the airplanes. Can you imagine that? Just in how many years? 1940s to 1990s. Five years, I mean 50 years. Almost uh, 300 feet of ice. They steamed it out, went down, made a cavern. They recovered that airplane. They took it out piece by piece, brought it to Middlesbrough, sent the machine guns off to the government, and they fixed them where they wouldn't operate anymore and sent them back. So it's going to have all of its original guns and everything on it. And they've, they've got it pretty well put back together now, and the guy's going to fly it here sometime in the near future. And he's going to give it to the Aviation Museum somewhere else. They're going to keep it over there. The point is, you get these Arctic conditions, you lay down this ice, you can lay down ice very thick, very quickly. Well, the book of Job, again, I'll try to give you these references later, has references to the ice and the snow and the ice age. Job looks like it occurred after the tower and about the time of Abraham. And then, of course, ice cores. They drill and get these ice cores. Layers are visible in the upper sections like what you would expect, but not in the lower. And this actually supports a biblical account for a post-flood ice age in that there was these uh, cyclonic, hurricanic storms that's laying this ice down in layers like that. That's also what you find when you dig that airplane out of the ice up there. You find those layers. And then, of course, the last one here is the mammoths. And we'll start here next week. Uh, thousands have been found, some intact, frozen, healthy appearances, well fed. They're found with rhinos, bison, bisons, and horses, mush ox, reindeers, and etc. And the problem is, you might explain how a mammoth lived in an in a Arctic conditions, but you can't explain how rhinos and these horses live because they need liquid water. Where are you going to find any liquid water in an Arctic area? So here you have these crocodiles and rhinos and bisons and horses and mush ox living right along with the mammoths, but they just pick out just the mammoths. And we'll talk about mammoths starting next week, okay?